Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. I'd like to take a minute to thank the Digital Chamber. I've been here the last two days, and uh, I think it's been a fantastic conference. Uh, and it really proves, you know, the fact that uh, blockchain in relation to application has so many use cases, and there's real potential. Um, so as it was announced, my name is Jesse Spiro. I'm the global head of policy with uh, Chainalysis, if you're unfamiliar. Um, and my background is in financial crime and compliance. Um, I've worked in this industry for many years, and one of the things that attracted me to chain analysis was the fact that there's real potential application there in relation to compliance and regulation. And so that's one of the things that I want to talk about today. So you know, when we talk about building trust in blockchains, um, you know, we talk about the, the boom in relation to cryptocurrency in 2017. We talk about the bust in 2018 uh, and what many people are, are defining kind of as the current crypto winter. But I think it's important to take a step back and note the fact that it is already increasingly mainstream. Uh, there's a staying power here. And what we've seen is, is that this industry has been kind of pugnacious in, in how it's been able to survive this. Uh, when we talk about, you know, $100 billion of approximate exchange traded volume per week and $25 billion of approximate on-chain Bitcoin, Bitcoin excuse me, volume per week, it shows that there's a substantial volume there uh, and that my expectation is and our expectation is that it's going to survive and eventually to thrive. And with distributed ledger technology uh, in relation to cryptocurrency and the blockchain, there's massive benefits for financial services. You know, accessibility, we're talking about accessibility uh, and providing access where previously uh, there may not have been for individuals in relation to moving money. You know, efficiency, obviously efficiency is, is also something that is going to be able to be streamlined and expedited more quickly. Collaboration is something uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, from a compliance standpoint, anyways, the fact that collaboration occasionally is very difficult for many different reasons. When you're talking about cross-border transactions and then you start talking about data protection and data privacy and other issues, this can be uh, a serious sticking point. Traceability, for me, is a big one. Uh, you know, traceability, when you're coming from an investigative standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, from anti-money laundering, the fact that the trace of it, uh, traceability is available uh, in relation to cryptocurrency is, is so important and is a real value add. You know, somebody likened this to me once, and I'm sure some of you have heard the same thing, that you know, if you take a dollar and you put that into a bank, it is uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to trace every cent. Uh, but that is not the case for cryptocurrencies. And being able to identify all of those touch points is very important. Security, obviously we are all familiar uh, with distributed ledger technology, so I'm not going to take too much time talking about this, but added security is another benefit. Audit trail, again, this is something to me that was very attractive. When we're talking about um, compliance, again, one of the important points when you're talking about technology is there's a lot of technologies that exist, um, but justification is an issue in relation to engaging with the regulators and identifying why a decision has been made and how it has been made. And that has slowed a lot of the potential progress that we've seen in relation to reg tech. And then finally, transparency. You know, the, the transparency that is afforded uh, in relation to cryptocurrency, the transparency that Chainalysis provides is something that is so attractive. So. There are massive benefits, obviously, um, but it is important for me to note when I'm talking about this that a lack of regulation, or as a caveat, a lack of global regulation has led, and oversight has led to systemic abuse, right? I think everybody in this room is probably familiar with a lot of the stories that you've heard in relation to cryptocurrency being used for illicit purposes, you know, um, dark net markets, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, mixing services, stolen bitcoins, scams, ransomware, child exploitation and sex trafficking, terrorism financing, and sanctions evasion. You know, all of these things have been identified. 
recently the scandal with Quadriga. You know, I think we can all probably agree, if you've been following that, that more will probably be revealed in relation to that. Um, and it's, it's, it's been difficult you know, for the industry. It certainly has given a bad name to the space. Uh, for me, what's important to note is having worked in traditional financial services, you know, this is not a problem that is specific to cryptocurrencies. This is a problem that uh, traditional financial services has faced also. Uh, and they've just been around far longer and they have had to, you know, uh, patch the fence. You know, bad actors, when we're talking about them, are always probing to find vulnerabilities and to exploit them in relation to how they move illicit money. And this is no different. Um, and as a result of some of that illicit activity, uh, you know, there was an opportunity for innovation. And that is how Chainalysis was born. You're all probably also familiar with the Mt. Gox hack when that happened. To date, and hopefully going forward, it was the largest hack in relation to cryptocurrencies that we have seen to date. But as a result of that, one of our co-founders, Michael Groniger, uh, decided that enough was enough. And some kind of solution needed to be identified and developed to effectively combat that. And so that's how Chainalysis was born. And Chainalysis makes blockchains more accessible and more transparent. And we do that by operating uniquely within this ecosystem. We provide products and services to all of the entities that exist within this ecosystem. Law enforcement and regulators, cryptocurrency businesses, and financial institutions. So the way in which we do this is as follows. And I should add, if you're looking for kind of a deep dive into the technical, I'm not the guy. I can certainly put you in touch with the folks that are. Um, but what you see on the blockchain in relation to a transaction is this. And what you see in chain analysis is to the right. Even if uh, each service, each of these, what we call clusters, has millions of addresses within them. And how we do that is by clustering, as I just mentioned. You know, cryptocurrency funds are situated on millions of alphanumeric addresses tied together in transactions. And we use human analysts and analytics to identify patterns in the way that these entities transact, and then we label them. And the end result of that is giving us a complete view of how those entities interact with the cryptocurrency ecosystem. When you're talking about illicit activity, that's really powerful, right? Because what that means is in relation to transaction screening, you can identify this information in real time, which historically has not been a capability. Uh, and in relation to investigations, there's more transparency and clarity than we've ever seen before. So in saying that, you know, it seems that there's a real opportunity in this space for things to change, to move forward, to mitigate a lot of that risk that has prevented, you know, cryptocurrency from being adopted more by mainstream financial institutions. So the question that follows is how do you move that needle, right? How do you move that needle and, and how do you get all of the players within that ecosystem to participate when it comes to uh, the exchanges and the services that provide this information? And the answer is regulation. Now I said that there had not been global regulation and this is true, but we've seen incremental movements uh, that are very positive in relation to global regulation that is coming. You know, in 2013, FinCEN issued its first guidance on virtual currencies and their regulatory responsibilities. 2014, NYDFS proposed the BIT license, which was formally launched in 2015. 2014, the IRS also issued their first guidance on taxation of virtual currencies. 2016, noticeably, is fairly absent. There was not a lot of regulatory activity. In 2017, uh, you know, the SEC introduced first regulation on ICOs. And in 2018, we saw a lot of promising activity in relation to regulation. Uh, particularly, you know, OFAC designating two addresses, uh, two Bitcoin addresses related to Iranian cyber actors. So 
Those kinds of designations or sanctions are going to be really important because what we know is when regulation is developed and adopted and in, in reviewing this language and seeing what that's going to look like, sanctions are going to be coming for the exchanges and those actors that are not compliant in relation to their laws. And as sanctions are applied and we see this, it is going to make it far easier to screen against that and again to cut off a lot of illicit activity. Also in 2018, uh, the EU lawmakers agreed and adopted the fifth AMLD, the fifth Anti-Money Laundering Directive, uh, which has to be applied by EU member states and specifically re referenced you know, uh, regulatory AML and CFT compliance regimes had to be in place. And finally, for 2019, what we're seeing is that FATF, Financial Action Task Force, if you're unfamiliar, the Financial Action Task Force is going to release their formal standards and regulation in relation to uh, virtual assets. And that's really important. It's really important because the Financial a Action Task Force is an intergovernmental body. Um, the G20 is going to adopt these standards. And in meeting with other global regulators, they're all waiting for this. And the expectation is going to be that that regulation is going to be implied and enforced uh, very closely in line with what FATF puts out. So I believe we're going to see a lot of follow-up activity in 2019 when that occurs. And that's really encouraging for the industry. So the last thing that I'm going to say is obviously, you know, that's going to be critical. Regulation is going to be critical to institutional and mainstream adoption. And I've listed a number of the value adds that the folks here are probably, again, already going to be familiar with. Um, you know, things like financial inclusion, uh, decreased underground banking, which is a big issue. You know, I think uh, for law enforcement, for regulators, for governments, the last thing that they want is underground banking. In traditional financial services, we call that de-risking, and it is a huge problem. It's a potential pain point, and, uh, you know, a lot of effort uh, goes into avoiding that. And again, there's potential here, if this is applied, that there will be less of that. You know, frictionless payments, I've heard that discussed many times here. Again, there's value. A decreased cost of compliance. This is also very important. It ties back into what we're talking about when we say, you know, potentially de-risking. One of the reasons that that occurs is for institutions to be compliant. The cost of compliance in those high-risk jurisdictions is too high in many cases. And the cost of compliance will be decreased if distributed ledger technology can be applied effectively, cryptocurrency specifically. So what I'm going to leave you with in my last minute is I think that in relation to how, uh, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is seen, we'll say cryptocurrency, in relation to which it's seen by financial services, that narrative already exists. But I think it's very important to add the potential for this to be a reg tech technology when it's applied. You know, uh, the fact that it's immutable, the fact that, you know, uh, real-time screening versus batch screening is available, um, and the transparency that it provides makes it in many ways more effective than what you're going to see in relation to the tools that are currently employed and deployed by traditional financial services. And to me, that is one of the things that is most exciting. It's one of the things that's most exciting about our company and what I do and about the future. Uh, of this industry and what we're going to see in this space. So uh, that is it from me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop me when we wrap up. So thank you.